Hello and welcome to History Respawned. I'm your host, John Harney. For this episode, we're looking at Paradox Interactive's Crusader Kings 2, specifically its expansion, Sword of Islam. Sword of Islam gives the player an opportunity to play as a Muslim ruler, rather than the Christian rulers offered in the original vanilla version of the game. Mechanics have been changed, tweaked, modified, so that you can be a polygamist, which brings pretty significant changes to the way the game is played, and also changes the way that you can declare war on other civilizations, such as introducing new types of casus belli specific to the Islamic theme. With me to discuss the game is Dr. Christine Baker, Assistant Professor of History at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Her work focuses on discourses of heterodoxy and orthodoxy in medieval Islam, the formation of different forms of Muslim identity in 10th century North Africa, Iraq and Iran, and how the development of those identities has been portrayed in historical narrative. Hi Christine, welcome to History Respond. (laughs) Hi John. We're really happy to have you. Uh, Crusader Kings 2 is a game that um, viewers have been asking for for a long time. Um, Of course, you're the expert now. You know a lot more about Islamic societies than I do, medieval Muslim societies than I do. Um, My first question, I guess, to get us started, to get our conversation started is, how do you feel about the representation of Muslims in this game? The one thing that I noticed was, like, clearly someone did their research. Uh, There's, like, a lot of detail in the maps and in some of the ways that they describe groups within uh, medieval Islamic society. Like, for example, like, when you have the maps up, you have, like, they mention, like, the Tahrids and the Alevids and the Dulavids and the Safarids, like... This is, like, way more detail than you would get on medieval Islamic society than even in, like, probably, like, a junior or senior level college textbook. Um, they're, like, literally, like, my, you know, I, I, I have my PhD in medieval Islamic history, and there were a couple of names that I was like, I'm not sure who those people are. Wow. Um, so I, this is going to sound maybe a little bit strange, but, like, some of the ways that they write some of these dynasties are actually a little bit old school. So <laughs> it, it's almost like I wonder if they got themselves, like, an early 20th century text about the medieval Islamic world. Like, oh, really? Something kind of, like, coming from, a, like, a very, like, Orientalist, but not like, in the pejorative sense, a very Orientalist perspective where people were just, like, really delving into all of these dynasties. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was really interesting to me. And I and I guess it makes sense because they want to talk about, like, war between different groups that are Christian and Muslim. You want to have as many groups as you possibly can. <laughs> um because, like, I wasn't 100% sure about the time period they were attempting to portray in the game. Do you know? Yeah, so the game originally, the kind of what you'd call the vanilla version of Crusader Kings 2 is kind of set kind of, I suppose, medieval period, like going towards the 15th century. It ends, the okay. quote-unquote endpoints 15th century, and all the expansions have kind of moved it earlier. Um, okay. So now, as I kind of, you know, gave you some footage of the expansion, you could start as early as the 8th century if you want. Oh, okay. I mean, because, you know, Crusader Kings, I'm assuming, you know, 11th century. We're kind of exactly. starting 11th yeah. or 12th century. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, in the the Middle East was kind of going through a weird period in, the in like, the 11th and 12th century. This was a period when nominally most of the Middle East was ruled by uh, an entity called the Abbasid Caliphate. And they definitely have the Abbasids on the map, but they also represent sort of the uh, the incredible disunity of the Middle East at this time because basically the Abbasid Caliph was he had this religious and political title but his actual ability to exert authority over territories in most of the Middle East had been pretty severely compromised and so there were lots of these sort of smaller petty rulers who were in charge basically these family dynasties Mm -hmm. like the Safarids and the Taharids and things like that the game does sort of it makes I mean, it was not a period of great unity and the game makes it look like even less unified than it was. But I think that that, it makes sense for the game. Um, And they've obviously done their research. Like they're using actual um, like family dynasties who did seize Mm -hmm. power for various time periods overall. And I I thought it was also really interesting. Like when they were talking about culture, like I sort of like made some notes at like what kind of cultures they described. Because like Greek, Berber, Egyptian, Levantine, Bedouin, Nubian, Persian, Baluch. They have like... 
like the Baluchis <laughs> in there. Uh, I taught a class on Iranian history, and I swear when I was started telling the students about the Baluchis, they literally thought I was making a thing up to troll them. Like they didn't, <laughs> they didn't think that existed. So now I can be like, go play Crusader Kings too. <laughs> Tell us more about the Baluchis then, so because oh, I don't know about them either. I don't. I actually don't know tons about the Baluchis. They're a small uh, ethnic minority, basically today what is sort of between uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and mm-hmm. they really would like their own independent state, <laughs> and that's kind of why they were relevant for our class. Fascinating. But they had definitely, my class had never, ever heard of this ethnic group. <laughs> Um, and I was like, the world is big, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fantastic. That kind of warms my heart as well. I mean, I, I had suspected as much, but, you know, as a fellow non-Western specialist, it's always great because this game did start out as, a ve- you know, it's called Crusader Kings, right? It's it's yeah. very European centric. Sure. I mean, you know, the whole setting and theme of the game. So yeah, it yeah. was exciting. I'm glad to hear this, that, that, you know, the sort of Islam expansion really... I love, it sounds like it's really going or it's trying to embrace complexity as kind of a, as a uh, part of the dynamic. The thing with Crusader Kings 2, of course, so it's a paradox game. It's this very uh, complex strategy game. But um, one of the things I think I think that's made it so successful is that people can get a hang of it because unlike other strategy games, they're kind of interactive maps, right? And quite slow paced and very complex. Is that in the Crusader Kings game, you control a character. And when he dies, you take over his heir and you take over the following heir and so on oh, and so on. And okay. so um, one of the things they've done in um, in, the, in the in the Sword of Islam, in this expansion, is, you know, you can have multiple wives. It includes polygamy um, and you can have a primary wife. In fact, the number of wives you have um, is um, tied to kind of the amount of respect you can get. So if you're a very high-ranked guy, but you only have two wives, you actually lose prestige per month. Um, but if you're a low-ranked guy with more wives, you gain prestige. Um, and that, it, they kind of they, they tried to make some changes to the dynamic in the game. So, for example, in uh, as a European ruler, obviously you can only marry one person, but also piety works very differently. So you have the, they have these things yeah. like currencies, you know what I mean? Presti- prestige and piety, mm-hmm. and you can spend these things. And for the Muslims, um, you can spend piety to do things like declare war and do various things like that. And there's a further mechanic in the game where um, if you have too many male relatives who, are, who have no land of their own, you gain decadence mm-hmm. as the years go by. Um, <laughs> and if you become decadent enough a kind of randomly spawned army from quote-unquote desert warriors just shows up and just completely wrecks you and destroys you and tears down your dynasty. That's really fascinating. Cause, no, because there's this um, this famous medieval Islamic historian named Ibn Khaldun, um, and I honestly don't remember when it is that he... I feel like he's writing in like the 11th mm-hmm. or 12th century, but he has this theory about how civilizations work. And one of his theories about how civilizations work is that you basically have like Bedouin warriors, they conquered some settled people, they settle, and then they do, they become decadent after hmm. too many generations, and that's when they become taken over from someone else. So I wonder if that's actually... Actually, I wonder if somebody read their Ibn Khaldun. That's intriguing. I mean, what, what, so what, what do you think of this? What do you think of the way the way I described it with like piety as currency and everything? You, you know, you can spend piety to declare war and stuff. I mean, this is something that I, as a non, I'm not an expert in the Islamic world at all or in Muslim society. But the I feel like the West does this a lot, and obviously sometimes in, in kind of scary ways. But there tends to be this connection between religion and war, and obviously there's some root of truth to that with the expansions of the eighth century and afterwards. Well, as a, as an expert, what do, what do you think of that? What do you think of those kind of connections? <sighs> Well, I think that I agree with you that there always is a connection between faith and war. But I think that there's this tendency when we view um, war in the Islamic world to want to view it as all about religion. And it's not. I mean, there are there's this religious mm-hmm. element, um, but it's always a facade, I think, over, you know, economic and political reasons for expansion. When I teach about Islamic civilizations in my world history class, Um, we've just spent half the semester studying the Byzantines. And so I try to get them to see that, like, you know, when the Muslims are expanding in the 7th and early 8th century and they go and they conquer, um, they literally go from just controlling um, a small portion of Arabia to by uh, 750, they control all of North Africa, most of Spain, most of what we think of as the Middle East, um, into uh, Central Asia and Afghanistan. And it's not about, it's not because they're converting people. It's not about conversion. Um, in fact, you know, it takes almost 300 more years for the Middle East to even become uh, majority hmm. Muslim. Um, it's a, 
they are expanding for the same reason that every empire in history wants to expand. It's about control of resources. You know, when you control more territory, um, you control the resources of those, ter those territories and you can tax the people who live in those territories. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always going to be a religious guise. Like it's always going to be about showing, you know, like, you know, just as the Byzantines said, you know, when they fought a war that they were going to talk about how when they won the war, it was because God was on their side. The Muslims are going to say the same thing, but that is not the overall motivation for going to war. Right. You know, yeah. because like you do have, of course, like you have alliances between Christians and Muslims as well um, throughout this period. And that's actually one of the reasons why the Crusades themselves are such a weird phenomenon. Uh, when they first come through, neither the Byzantines nor the Muslims really understand the Crusader point of view because they're so used to dealing with both Christian and Muslim dynasties that they're like, wait, mm -hmm. what do you mean you are going to war with all the Muslims? <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a lot of us and, and we don't like those Muslims either. Like, don't you want to ally with us against those other Muslims? <laughs> and the Crusaders are like, no. <laughs> And eventually the Crusaders do figure it out. Once they form like Crusader states, right. they then will, um, they will make some alliances with Muslim states against other, about against other, uh, other, other Muslims and such. But, uh, so like, yeah, I mean, making piety as a currency is a little bit, feels a little disingenuous. Sure. Cause I don't think, I don't think that's the way that they would present Christian Kings of this time period where it is, it's kind of, I would say that it's 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 very similar with um, with the way that piety is used to motivate mm -hmm. people um, to go to war, but at the same time, most people are not going to war just for reasons of religion. Right, and and, and these Christians that the Muslims are making alliances with, I mean, are they? I mean, is is this more of an issue of geography? It's just Christians that are closer to the Middle East or in the Middle yeah. East, or I mean, is it Orthodox versus Catholic kind of thing? Like, you know, which is which is more. I think it's it's more of an issue of geography. So, for example, in the in the 10th century, the Middle East is not particularly unified. Um, the Abbasid Caliphate is in power. Their capital is Baghdad. They are technically they claim to rule all Muslims, um, just the way that the Byzantines would the Byzantine emperor would claim to be the emperor for all Christians mm -hmm. and gets really angry when the Pope crowns Charlemagne the Holy Roman <laughs> Emperor in 800 because it's like no no it doesn't matter if we don't control those lands where Christians live we are the king of all the Christians so the Muslim caliph in Baghdad does the same thing but in the 10th century he basically gets um, uh, two rivals for power. You get a second caliphate in North Africa um, called the Fatimids, and they uh, they declare a second caliphate in 909, and they will eventually um, uh, uh, establish the city of Cairo. Um, and then you have a third Muslim caliphate in Spain. They are called the Umayyads of Spain, and their caliphate is, uh, their capital is in Cordoba. And so there's rivalries between these three different Muslim powers and the Byzantines are kind of in the middle of it because the Byzantines control um, they mainly keep control over Anatolia maybe a little bit of what would today be like northwest Syria parts of Lebanon um, they of course control most of Greece parts of the Balkans and so like for example like the Fatimids and the Byzantines will fight over the control of um, um, some of the Mediterranean islands so sometimes they're at war but sometimes they have trade alliances so it's just like they they have like normal diplomatic relations just the way that other, mm -hmm. you know, other states would, uh, regardless of religion. There's actually a record that Charlemagne actually sent a delegation to visit the Abbasid Caliph um, at some point, which is really wow, interesting. fascinating. Uh, so, yeah, like they just they do just have these relations. And so when it's convenient, they will ally with other with powers of other religions against their rivals. So, like, if the Fatimids and the Byzantines are both kind of want to go to war with the Abbasids, that is convenient for mm -hmm. them to create an alliance then. It doesn't mean that they're like, you know, best friends and they love each right. other forever. Once they defeat the Abbasids and push them back, it's very likely that then they will go to war. But it's the medieval period, there's always this guise of religion that's overlaid over everything. But I, and I do think there is certainly a degree of uh, authenticity about that. But I also think that their decisions were still very pragmatic mm -hmm. in terms of diplomacy and economics and, and uh, political relations and sort of what kind of territories they control. Um, so to kind of pretend that's not the case, I just think a lot of it, I don't know how much the game is portraying 
Muslims wrong and how much it's just we have a tendency to view the medieval period in this way overall. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about the game, the game's quite bloodthirsty, you know, so because the because the game is based on these individuals, you know, you can plot to kill somebody. So, you know, particularly in the, I at least in my experience playing Sword of Islam, you get awful problems with these factions that build up and one of the best ways to dismantle them is to convince enough other characters to plot with you to kill somebody and take them out. And so in the European, sure. yeah, and in the European game, Game, you know the vanilla game I suppose um, you know so a bishop dies of syphilis and things like this gee I wonder how he got that um, but certainly in the game so we talked about the decadence mechanic I mean you can lower that by going on the hajj um, which obviously you can do once oh, yeah. a year and it will kind of do these interesting things that is also present in other other parts of the game for, for non-Muslim rulers you know you have these little encounters so you meet an old man on the road and he has a document that he says is, is mystical do you want to stay with him or do you want to leave and there's potential penalties to various characteristics and things like that so when you go to the Hajj uh, and you're you, when you're actually in Mecca um, um, and you're you're doing the circles around I should know this because uh, I play the game the, but you the Kaaba thank you the Kaaba you can choose to either kind of go around the circuit kind of discreetly and you have a chance of becoming more modest uh, which gives you certain penalties and certain modifiers to your character or you can walk around loudly doing the circuit multiple times and yelling <laughs> at the appropriate stations so oh, those are these little things and and the idea is to try and act as modifiers and I think one of the things the game does well is it kind of has it tries to inject a bit of sense of humor to it I suppose um, yeah. which I guess is something westerners would usually be scared of doing when it comes to <laughs> to Muslim societies yeah. no really you know yeah 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 no, what I think is really interesting is like you what you said earlier that it the game is handling complexity well. Like certainly there are, you know, there are Muslim rulers uh, who were incredibly pious. And so they were, you know, so when they went to war, maybe more of it was about religion, about mm-hmm. not about there's there there are like there are rules in Islam you're not allowed to force people to convert. So it's not about forcing conversion, but it is about conquering territory in the name of Islam. But then you also have rulers that are not particularly pious. And so it's <laughs> kind of cool to me that the game allows for that. You know, that it's yeah. not you don't have to be it's not all about, you know, going to war for God. That, you know, you can go to war for, or you know, you can go to war for other reasons and you can like pretend to be pious and you can be loudly pious or quietly pious. And, right. And that's like you know, that, I feel like that is true to life that you have this mix of people. And that I think that's the part that I find the most interesting and the most laudable about what mm-hmm. I've seen of the game, that it, it is it is representing complexity in the Islamic world. So it's not just these like, you know, barbarian Muslim groups that want to go fight in the name of Islam. Um, right. So there is some of that, but yeah, <laughs> I kind of expect, you know, sort of with a popular video game like this, that you're going to have a little bit of that. But it's nice that they also represent some complexity and that, you know, like the people who made the game had to go do research about how it is that you, you mm-hmm. go on the hedge and how that works. Like that's, I don't know, I think that's interesting. So at least people might learn a little bit about Islam while mm-hmm. playing the game. Yeah, I like that the game and uh, this game, I feel like it seems, it feels to me has a, a fairly clear sense of self-awareness. You control a guy who the Pope thinks very highly of, and then um, one day a dialogue box pops up and says, "You know, one of the women of the court is looking, is giving, you know, is is looking at you. Do you want to? Don't have an affair or not? And if you have an affair, it makes you more robust physically, or it gives you a kind of a second oh wind for you, know, and all these goofy things. And so you can kind of role play it if you want to do yeah. it that way. Um, but there's also a kind of a sense because there's a slightly because the game is not trying to be goofy or camp." But I feel like there's this kind of you could play it that way if you wanted. And so it kind of allows you to kind of have your cake and eat it, too, I suppose, to say real people do things that aren't always cool or real people do things that don't run congruent to the the public face of their yeah. whatever, whatever ideology, whether yeah. it's religious or not, you know. And people aren't consistent in general. Yes. Like, you know, people <laughs> you can say one thing and then for whatever reason, do something completely separate. And it doesn't mean that you didn't necessarily believe the thing that you said. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. No, it's it's interesting. I, it really is. Yeah, I don't, and I don't want to. I mean, if we could talk about complexity for a few more minutes, because I don't want to kind of toss you the most predictable softball of all time. But <laughs> or or which is sometimes the worst question you could be asked, right? It's like, how do sure. I even answer this? But um, I feel there is kind of this long running. Um, experience that Europeans have of like existential threats right Uh Um, and you know I mean Genghis Khan becomes seen as one a couple of centuries afterwards but I mean certainly you know Muslim forces get as far as modern day Spain and they stay there for you know a few centuries Um, 
leading into, for example, the Crusades, so we're talking about like viewing the Muslim world, com- you know, in a complex fashion. You said a few minutes ago you talked about there were Christian Muslim alliances, and the the Crusade is kind of hard for them to deal with. I mean, is that how the Muslims viewed the Crusades? I mean, the, you know, because the Westerner, some Westerners saw Islam as this existential threat. For the Muslims, was the were the Crusades something just bizarre and invasive, or do you know what I mean? How, how what was the reaction to that? I think to a certain extent, when the Crusades first occurred, the Muslims just didn't completely understand what they were about. And part of it was that um, the very first Muslim interactions with the Crusades were not with official Crusaders. Um, So I don't know how much you know about the Crusades, but basically when Pope Urban II uh, calls for the Crusade in 1095, he's actually, he really wants like, the knights of Europe, like the, mm-hmm. the the warriors, the military class of Europe to respond to his call. Um, but he's just a little too successful in <laughs> preaching for this. And so there is um, a hermit named Peter. Um, we remember him as Peter the Hermit, um, <laughs> who starts preaching in what is today like France and Germany. And basically he, he like goes from town to town riding on a donkey barefoot. So like a lot of Jesus Christ symbolism there. Um, He claims that he has a letter from God, like this mystical letter that Mm -hmm. God wrote him telling him that everyone has to go on crusade. Hmm. And he actually gets a lot of just regular people, like sort of, I guess you might think of them as like, I guess, peasants. Uh, I don't know exactly sure how to describe (laughs) them, but they're not like, these are not military people. He basically gets this popular movement to follow him and they march across Europe kind of, um, pillaging as they go and massacring a lot of Jewish communities, actually, because if you when you rile people up to fight um, people of another faith, um, it's often hard to control what they'll attack. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they get to, to Constantinople and the Byzantine emperor is like, you are not an army like you can't you cannot go fight. Um, the Seljuk Turks, who was the group that the Byzantines were concerned about um, and who had conquered Anatolia. And Peter the Hermit is like, no, God has willed this. We are going to go fight um, the Seljuks. We want to go fight the Muslims. And they actually start pillaging Constantinople. So eventually the Byzantine emperor is like, fine, here, I will ferry <laughs> you across the Bosphorus to get you out of my hair. And, you know, what? when you have basically a group of religious fanatics armed with maybe like farm implements, you know, go up against like the, a hardened, seasoned um, force, they are annihilated. Right. Um, and so this is remembered as the People's Crusade, and it kind of predates the first official crusade. Um, and so when the actual official real military crusaders get there, like the Celtics don't really take the threat very seriously because their first encounter with these crusaders were like this, it was this group of rabble that were very wow. e- easily defeated. Um, but like the Middle East has, so at the time, the Seljuk Turks are a group of sort of, it's a Central Asian sort of nomadic group that comes into, that enters the Middle East in like the ninth century. Um, they are Muslim, um, and they take over the territory of the Abbasid Caliphate, but they kind of keep the Abbasid, uh, Caliph as, sometimes he's just a figurehead, sometimes he's able to exert more authority than that. Um, but they are fighting against the, the Fatimid dynasty who has power in um, Egypt and parts of Syria. And so they are competing against each other. So the Seljuks that conquer Jerusalem um, and then the Fatimids take it back. And so they're struggling over control of Jerusalem themselves. And so they are eager to ally with the Crusaders because they're like, oh, wait, do you want to fight the Seljuks? We don't like the Seljuks. We'll fight the Seljuks too. But the Crusaders are not really, um, the Crusaders don't want to do that. I think that part mm-hmm. of it is that the Middle East especially in this period, they have so many different groups that move through and there are lots of different kinds of conquests um, because, you know, we, the Middle East, of course, is a very sort of Eurocentric term, but this is a territory that de- does tend to get sort of invaded by lots of outside groups. And so it's just the Crusaders are just one other outside group. Huh. Um, and one of the reasons why the Crusaders are able to conquer Jerusalem in 1099 is partly because the Muslims are not unified. And it's not until um, Saladin 
Mm -hmm. um, or Salah Adin um, comes to power in, and he's sort of like a, a general in Syria, and then he actually he takes over the Fatimid Caliphate. So he's in power in Cairo, and he is the one that actually unifies different Muslim groups and says, like, we actually need to be unified as Muslims to fight this Christian threat. And he's one of the people that starts to use jihad as an idea to convince other Muslims to wage war against um, the Christians. So all of these Muslim groups had been fighting sort of the crusader groups and the Byzantines, or sometimes not, sometimes there's peace, of course. Um, but it is um, Saladin who is able to use sort of these um, religious ideas to sort of try and reunify Muslims to fight against mm -hmm. um, the crusaders. And I'm, and, and partially like that kind of, to me makes the game seem more, authentic because he does like he basically like he's gonna kick up his piety in order to, <laughs> to do this because you know they lost because they were uh, not because they were they were disunified so i don't know that's it, it's interesting because like once the crusaders establish states like they, they establish like five main crusader states they don't particularly like each other either because like of course europe is like all of the Europeans are fighting each other. One of the reasons that the Pope wants to have this crusade is because he's like, maybe if I give them a common enemy, they'll stop fighting each other. Nice. Um, and so they just kind of, they just become another force in sort of this very disunified Islamic world. That's fascinating because that, that, that was kind of the, the next question I wanted to ask you. So I find uh, in the game, it's much easier to declare war on another on another uh, civilization or another community as a Muslim character than it is as a European character. So one of the one of the central mechanics of the game is is a, you need to get a, you need to have a casus belli uh, mm -hmm. in order to wage war on somebody. And uh, ordinarily, when you're a European power, um, what I do in the game is um, I I send my minister in there to fabricate a claim. But you <laughs> but you uh, but you can also you can try and marry into that family. So one of my favorite playthroughs, I went from being somehow a relatively unknown Irish duke to the king of Italy and parts of North Africa. Um, okay. Yeah, and so the game simulates this, and that this is kind of, this is actually one of the more fun central elements of the game. Um, and it's a little bit different in, if for the Islamic characters because of polygamy and everything else. What you can do is you can declare jihad against a non-Muslim um, uh, a non-Muslim uh, civilization. You can uh, declare a holy war against um either if you're Sunni against the Shiites, if you're Shiite against the Sunni, and you can call on other co-religionists within that sect of, of Islam to join you. Um, and you can also just go ahead and uh, try and conquer a bordering territory. And Muslim countries could just can just do that, like you're allowed to do it. And it costs you piety, um, but they just call it like the Muslim conquest option. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we've been talking, I suppose, about war and kind of civilization and this kind of concept of jihad. So, I mean... Maybe I know it's just a game mechanic, but is it easier for those leaders to, to drag their, their societies into war? Um, is jihad a mechanism that allows... It sounds like Saladin did that. You, you know what I mean? That's certainly... I mean, obviously, jihad is, 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 is oversimplified all the time yeah. um, in the Western world. But, you know, how, how does that play? I don't think it's any easier for Muslims to go to war with other Muslims or other religions than it was for Christians at this time period. I mean, because this mm -hmm. is a time period where there's there's an incredible amount of um, of fighting amongst uh, European, you know, uh, kings and other kind of uh, uh, lords and sort of feudal rulers. Like this is a period where there's a lot of warfare. Um, Overall, um, mm -hmm. and empires are always looking to expand because, again, it's about control of resources and religion can be a pretext. Um, jihad itself, I mean, as you said, does tend to get oversimplified um, because it's interesting to me. Like, are you saying that in the game that you can wage jihad or holy war? Are they making them different? They're making them different. But I think in defense of the developers, I think a lot of this is they're kind of they're playing with mechanics a little bit. No. Do you know what no, I mean? No, but it's actually interesting that they make them different to mm -hmm. me. Because, I mean, jihad doesn't mean holy war. Jihad, literally, the word means struggle. And it's sort of, it's usually thought of as, like, this inner struggle against evil. So, like, when I am waging, if I was to mm -hmm. wage, like, an, a jihad, it might be, like, you know, uh, if I were a pious Muslim, but I also liked to drink, mm -hmm. you know, I would be, like, deciding not to have a drink would be a jihad. Like, I, huh. you know what I mean? Like, that's a the yeah, inner yeah. struggle. Or... 
you know, or I'm really tired and I don't want to go to the mosque today. Right. Uh, but forcing myself to do that, that is waging that jihad. That's an mm. inner struggle um, against evil. And it does, I mean, the sort of traditional definitions of jihad separate it into four different categories. There's the jihad of the heart, which is that inner struggle. Um, jihad of the tongue, which is where, like, if you see somebody doing a wrong thing, you speak out against it. Um, jihad of the hand, and that can involve uh, both intervening if you see someone doing something wrong or um, giving to charity is considered jihad of the hand, like helping the Muslim community. And then finally, jihad of the sword. Um, and uh, Muslim scholars have throughout the centuries debated when it is appropriate or inappropriate to, to wage jihad of the sword. And the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad are not always completely clear about this it generally it often gets presented as a defensive war but then you also will have groups that will use the, the idea of jihad as um in a more aggressive manner mm -hmm. um but like saladin he seems to be, i mean i think that you can make a fairly solid argument that it's a defensive war that the crusaders <laughs> came in from europe you know and and they're saying that they want to come in and conquer jerusalem to win jerusalem back from the muslims um and and, and there is some legitimacy to that argument but at the same time they are doing this in 1095 and the Muslims conquered Jerusalem in 638. So there's, there's also a little <laughs> bit like, uh, what took you so long? Right. Um, so there is certainly an element of defensive war about it. It's about sort of protecting the lands of Islam. Um, and so it's interesting to me that they do separate it between like jihad and holy war. So I kind of like that they don't equate them, mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm sort of assuming that they're not using jihad in a sense that doesn't mean jihad of the sword. So I'm not exactly no. sure what they would mean by <laughs> uh, by having those terms separate, because it's really the, the Christian side in the Crusades that really come up with this new definition of holy war. I mean, what the what Pope Urban II does when he tells people that they need to go to Jerusalem to win back Jerusalem to fight war in the name of God, like that's a really new idea for Christianity mm -hmm. when Urban II does that. And the way that he does it is he doesn't actually frame it in terms of a war. He basically says that they're going on a pilgrimage. Um, it's just an armed pilgrimage, <laughs> you know, because that's, yeah. that's sort of the, 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 the sort of the religious construction that he uses. Right, um, right. And that, that like that, that's where we get the word crusade from. Crusade doesn't come from. They never called it a crusade. They weren't like, "I'm going on the first crusade now. See you next year." <laughs> um, it was uh, when you when you agreed to go on crusade, you uh, you 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 basically signed by the cross, pledging to go. Mm -hmm. And that phrase in Latin is "cruce signate," so that's where we get crusade oh. from. Because Pope Urban II, uh, the descriptions that we have of when he declared this first crusade, he must have been he. He definitely could have gone to PR. Um, he basically <laughs> gives this big speech in in Clermont because um, uh, I don't I don't know how many of your listeners will know this, but when Pope Urban II calls for the crusade, um, there is so much turmoil in Europe that there are multiple popes. There's an anti-pope that he's dealing with, and so he's not even in Rome. Um, and <laughs> he is basically one of the reasons he wants to wage crusade um, for on a very pro pragmatic reason is that he wants to show that he has God's authority, that he can call on all of the Christians of Europe and the Byzantine Empire to go and fight this war against the Muslims. Um, and so he has this big meeting in Clermont where he, he gives these speeches and then he basically asks at the end, you know, who will, who will go and defend Jerusalem? And he has peppered the crowd with some supporters. And so they like stand up and they were like, I will go, God wills it. <laughs> and he literally, like the descriptions that we have, it's like, I, and I'm simplifying a little bit, but it's like he literally has seamstresses off in the wings who then run into the crowd and they're like sew crosses on someone's cloak because right. they have now signed by the cross to go on crusade. Um, <laughs> and I think that I've just rambled and gotten completely away from whatever your question was. No, no, because it's, um, it's, 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 I think, I think, I hope our viewers <laughs> will like that, our listeners will like that because, um, you know, Crusader Kings, one of the things I like the game very much Um I can't say I've got into depth with some of the mechanics, but like you can really, you can become really invested in things like um, pun not intended in investiture and things like that. Oh so you my can, God, of course, you, yeah. you can get involved in the Pope and all this stuff. Yeah, the investiture controversy is that's also one of the reasons why the Pope. You know, the Pope is fighting with the Holy Roman Emperor over who has the power to decide who is the Pope and other religious right. offices. Um, and of course, don't forget that when the Crusades start, we are less than a generation generation away from what we consider the split between Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. And so the Pope, mm -hmm. to a degree, was probably hoping that if he 
goes and he helps the Byzantines and they lead the successful war that that, that rift would mend. Because the, the Great Schism is uh, the, the sort of the event that of the Great Schism when like the Pope goes to Constantinople and the Patriarch um, of Constantinople excommunicates the Pope and all of his representatives. And so the Pope excommunicates the Patriarch and all of his representatives. When we That's what we consider the Great Split. That's not officially healed. Not mm -hmm. healed. I mean, obviously there are still uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians and Roman Catholics, but they don't rescind to those excommunications until 1964. <laughs> but you can imagine that in 1095, because it's only been about 30 years, that there might have been the, well, if we if we go to war and we, def we help the Byzantines, that we will then show that the Pope should really be in charge and we will kind right. of mend that rift. Right. Uh, there's just, there's a lot going on on the European side that's really also fascinating that leads into the Pope's decision um, to go and wage war in the Middle East. Because like, that's actually a really... It's kind of a weird decision because the Middle East is quite far away from him. And mm -hmm. Jerusalem, while important for Christians, Christians have been able to go on pilgrimage while Jerusalem is under Muslim rule. There are times when it stopped. And, and of course, notably, when the Seljuks conquered Jerusalem, they actually end Christian pilgrimage to the city for a little bit. Um, but then they reverse that decision in part because that brings a lot of revenue. It's basically like tourism right. money today, if you're thinking about it in modern wow. terms. Um, but so it's. If you think about like the Pope off in Rome convincing like the the rulers of like France and um, and England and Germany to go basically take their armies and literally walk across Europe, get ferried across the Bosporus by the Byzantine Emperor, and then walk across Anatolia to Jerusalem to you know fighting most of the way once they get into Anatolia. It's an incredibly bizarre historical decision <laughs> i mean yeah this is something i mean in the game for example you know playing as a muslim character you could declare jihad on the king of norway if you want like the game allows you to do that to just decide i'm really angry at the danish right now or the norwegians or the <laughs> irish let's go and fight and in the game it's a comically stupid thing to do like you just you know <laughs> europe will just annihilate you or will annihilate you on the on the edges at least but um, I guess to wrap up, uh, I kind of one more thing actually to ask you about, you know, you really, really enjoyed hearing about kind of the complexities within Europe. How does the Sunni, Sunni Shiite um, divide work geopolitically in, you know, the 10th and 11th centuries, for example? I mean, again, you've kind of already said that, you know, religion, obviously, and politics, these are these are kind of they're going to their salience will rise and fall kind of to each other, I suppose. Sure. Um, you know, but it, was it was it difficult for Sunnis and Shiites to ally together, or was it just completely dependent on political expediency and and whatever the you know whatever was best for them in in the short term? Uh, both. Uh, the tenth century is a really <laughs> interesting period, and if you look in uh, sort of textbooks about medieval Islamic history, they will often describe the tenth century as the Shi'i century, mm -hmm. um, because during this period when the Fatimids come to power, the Fatimids are a Shi'i dynasty. And so when they claim to be the caliphs, they are claiming that the, the caliphate should only be held by descendants of the Prophet Muhammad through his daughter Fatima and her husband Ali, who is also the, um, the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad himself. So they are making this claim and they are a Shi'i dynasty. But the Abbasids in Baghdad are Sunni and then the Umayyads of Spain are also Sunni. And there is certainly a rivalry there. Um, but at the same time, in the 10th century, uh, the, the Abbasids get taken over by this Iranian dynasty called the Buyids, and the Buyids are also Shi'i, and they are Shi'i hmm. rulers, and they are ruling the Sunni capital of Baghdad, and because they can't claim to be caliphs, because they're Iranian, they're not, they're not Arab, so they can't make any kind of claim to be a caliph, they hmm. basically keep the Sunni Abbasid caliph around. Partially as a figurehead, but then sometimes, depending on who the caliph is, um, he is able to exert more power. Um, hmm. And then the Fatimids, they are Shi'i, but they are also very conscious of the fact that um, they have a lot of Sunni Muslim um, uh, subjects. And so they don't, like rigidly enforce any kind of Shi'i practice. They certainly preach um, um, these kinds of Shi'i ideas, but it's not about forcing people to follow um, Shi'i Islam. It's a lot more complex than that. Um, and so the, the 10th century is really when the idea of like, you really are for the first time, oh, I don't even know how to put this, 
like the idea of what it means to be Shi'i and, diff and different types of Shi'i um, really come to the fore because once you have Shi'i rulers, one in um, Baghdad and one in Cairo, they start to sponsor specific forms of like Shi'i scholarship and theology and start to really define what that means to be mm -hmm. Shi'i. And I, and I should note that the Fatimids are a different type of Shi'i ruler than, than the Buyids. Um, so they are also rivals, even though they're both Shi'i. And so <clears throat> again, it is, it's more complex than like all Shi'is are always going to fight Sunnis and vice versa. Right. Um, you definitely have periods when there is war between different Shi'i states, but um, and between Shi'i and Sunni states, but then you also have, you will have Sunnis that are perfectly happy to fight each other. Like the Abbasids come to power, they are Sunni, although they use a lot of Shi'i overtones in their rise to power to get Shi'is to support them, um, but they overthrow another Sunni dynasty. So it's, again, it's not about, um, we have a tendency to see Sunni and Shi'i as a very sort of black and white conflict that they mm -hmm. always fight each other. But again, it, it tends to be more about other other kinds of political um, and economic issues that you put this sort of sectarian lens over. Listen, Christine, thank you so much for joining us. It was a real pleasure to have you. It was really fun. And thank you, everybody, for watching. We hope you enjoyed this episode of History Respond and that you'll tune in again next month.